Okay, I just want to introduce my all-star panel here. Um, next to me, I don't think I need to introduce him really. I'm sure everybody in the room knows, but we have Benjamin Brad, who was an actor on Law and & Order and played Detective Ray Curtis. We also have Charlotte Brunsden, a professor of film and television studies at the University of Warwick. We have Arthur Fournay, who um, heads post at Wolf Films and also has been a co-executive co producer of Law & Order for many years. Next to him, we have Lisa Hajar, uh, associate professor of sociology at UC Santa Barbara, and then Pam Gollum at the end, president of, of Entertainment West Coast at the Lippin Group. So we've assembled this group of creatives and scholars and a, an amazing publicist for the <laughs> series to help us discuss um, the ways in which this series has been so <coughs> socially significant. And I thought we might start out with, um, you know, just a question for everybody that as a, you know, as a series that's been on the air for more than 20 years, um, it has the potential to educate viewers about our legal system, the players in it, and, and how that works. You know, what kind of messages do you think um, Law & Order sends to its audience about crime, prosecution, guilt, innocence, justice in the US? And if you want to add kind of any particular moments or episodes that played a key role in making those points. Um. I, I would say that before you even discuss why or how the show is socially impactful, it's, it's equally important to talk about why it's a, a success and why it's so uh, widely copied. And I think um, if you distill the show down to its essence, it's, it's a demonstration of great storytelling which is something any person anywhere in the world, whether you're from the remotest, most primitive tribe in South America to uh, the most urbane, sophisticated society, we rely upon the stories that we tell about ourselves. And in this particular medium, um, and in this particular show, every episode is a kind of morality play. Mm -hmm. And that's, that holds true for all of drama as it's been written over the centuries, whether you're talking about Shakespeare mm -hmm. or or Euripides, or, um, or anyone else. Whatever action's going on within the story, it's a, a kind of reflection of who we are and what our values are um, in the society that it's played to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, law and order allows us, as, as citizens of this country, to see ourselves and where we fit mm -hmm. within the criminal justice system. I think for a lot of a lot of years before Law and Order came out, there was uh, something kind of uh, mysteriously scary about what the penal system is like, what the, how the, the judicial system works. Um, but Law and Order took it on back in 1990 in a way that no show had done before it, uh, which was to um, not condescend to the audience in terms of its reputation, representation of, of how it is in the world. It doesn't pander to its audience. It's very smart. Um, and it shows that justice is kind of a slippery uh, ideal mm -hmm. that is something that we are constantly looking for. It's not a tangible material nugget like a piece of gold you can put in your pocket and count on to get. It's actually something that's highly and historically negotiable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Deals are being made all the time. And that's kind of, it takes a kind of unabashed look at that process and the reality of that. And, and it's shocking in its reality, but it's also very dramatic, which makes a good TV show. It's, I'll just say one thing is that it's, it's really is a show, I think, that does something that a lot of other t television doesn't do. It really is a reflection of our society throughout the years and it, it's, it, micro focuses on specific events, but it's not just the event that we debate sometimes. It personalizes that event to the point where the audience, or it makes it accessible to them so that they can actually relate to it. So when you turn off the television, you actually can have a debate about it mm -hmm. or about the issue or about the specifics of what's happened on each of the shows. Years ago, 
uh, I did an episode about the uh, the vests. I directed an episode about the um, the military vests that. Um, and and the debate of that of that is is, you know, you couldn't, a military officer could not go out and buy his own vest, and use it even though it was better than the potentially better than the vest that the government was providing for them, and if he was killed in that vest, his wife and the family would not mm. get the, the 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 finances or the death benefits, uh, benefits mm -hmm. from from his death. And it forced them to all use the military vests that they were being provided. And but it was an interesting debate going on about that. But it, we also personalize it to uh, individuals, so that when you discuss it, you it wasn't just the issue; it was also the specifics of that case. And I think Law and Order does that better than anybody else. I'm not trying to pat ourselves on the back, but I am. <laughs> but well, that, that's but I just think that that's, that's <laughs> one of the things that I think we do so well is just, just bring it into something that's accessible for the audience to see. Also, the show has been really remarkably prescient over the years. Um, and there are several examples, but one that was really chilling, and this is going back several years ago, but there was a, an episode about a woman with Munchausen by proxy. And um, it aired, I believe it was like in around um, October, November, it's going back about 16 or 17 years. And literally after that episode aired, um, there was the, and I'm, and I'm thinking about it because there was another similar tragedy this week, but uh, Susan Smith, um, it was the, the Susan Smith uh, when she drove her kids into the, into the river, and unfortunately that also happened this week, but that's why I'm kind of thinking about it. But there have been a lot of episodes where it's, it's actually almost creepy, where you will cover something and then it actually happens afterwards, and it's really, there's no cause and effect other than the fact that the show really does kind of hit every issue imaginable, and, and it really is, as, as Arthur said, very reflective of real life. Mm -hmm. I would just, um, well, just going back to the clip uh, that you showed and the example that Arthur gave, I think many of the shows do create, provide amazing insights into the um, sort of the regular aspects of American life, but some of these shows have been extraordinary interventions on very political um, issues. And I think that the Vest episode it was very much engaging an audience who may not be following details about the war on terror, the war in Iraq, the way in which, you know, then uh, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld had in fact thought of, you know, fighting the war on the cheap and mm -hmm. the, the, the ongoing human consequences for that. But this particular episode, um, Jen, that you had decided to show is in a country where we've never had any accountability for torture, that episode was like mm -hmm. a fantasy. I mean, and especially mm -hmm. for people who care about this stuff. And the the dialogue of the John Yu character is literally things that John Yu has actually said. So for people who aren't familiar with John Yu, who now teaches law at Berkeley, or who haven't read the torture memos, at least they can get it in reruns on TNT. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and... Um, you know, I'm wondering, also, Law & Order has also has often been described as being ripped from the headlines, right? That's its kind of famous um, tag. And many, like you're saying, many of the episodes are based on actual cases. And so I'm wondering, Pam, as um, your role as a publicist, you know, how you had to deal with perhaps any fallout or actual, <laughs> you know, about the controversy, because the show deals with these issues not in a you know, not in a lightweight well, way. Often. First of all, and, and, and this, is, this is the line that has been used so many times, but the, when the press call, they say, I know, law and order is fiction. So whenever anything happens, and if you want to Google and go back and, and look at the way a lot of these stories mm -hmm. kind of broke down, you will always see that quote from whether it was me or, or somebody from the network or, or anybody. One of the producers, Law and Order is fiction. So that's the first thing that we have to say is that Law and Order is fiction. <laughs> that said, um, yes, if you talk to the writers, if you talk to the producers, um, they do, well, actually, when Dick was interviewed a long time ago, 
he had said, and he has said this on repeated occasions, that when he first sold the show and um, Brandon Tartikoff said, okay, what's the Bible for the show? He said the Bible is the front page of the New York Post. So I think that kind of has set the tone. And, you know, there's, yes, there are a lot of, there are a lot of episodes where, you know, you're into the first, or, you know, I'm reading the script, you're into the first or second act, and you're going, okay, that, but then it takes a completely, di I mean, Arthur, you know, it's a completely different turn. So, yes, it may be the headline, but the body copy is completely different. So, yes, I think that the show has been very successful from a lot, from, on a lot of levels doing that, but it is fiction. And Arthur, what is the process of ripping from the headlines? <laughs> Hi, here's the headlines. So what can we take this story and this other story and put it together to, to put in an episode? Renee can answer that better than anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know if I'm the one, uh, but uh, being where I am today, I, I just want to say this. One of the funniest things has happened to me is there's three things. One day I got a phone call from a Denver district attorney's office. And my assistant says, well, there's this guy who says he's from the district attorney's office in Denver. OK. So I pick up the phone, and he goes, uh, hi, my name. He, introduced, he does this whole introduction. He says, well, you know, we have a case that, um, that is similar to one of your shows. And we would like to know if we could get a copy of it because we're trying to figure out what angle we're supposed to take on this case. <laughs> and it was like the strangest dose of reality. You were going, uh, wow. wow, they're calling us now. <laughs> and so I forgot what copy it was, but we sent him a copy. And of course, they sent us a note back about you know a couple weeks later. And I didn't know how the trial is. They said we couldn't mention the trial. But of course, when he said the show, I was like, oh, you're doing a murder case about, you know, about whatever the specifics were. And, but it was funny that you know, a district attorney's office is calling you. And, and then um, one time, I was shooting um, in Alphabet City. Um, and um, we were walking down the street after a break. And this lady walks out of her, out of her apartment, and she has a, like a little three-year-old. And so she says, what are you guys shooting? And I said, well, we're shooting Law and Order. And she goes, oh, honey. She turns her little down and goes, oh, it's Dun Dun. And the little baby goes, <laughs> Dun Dun. And we're like, wow. She goes, you know, every time we're watching the show and one of the cars go with the ching, the ching ching, the baby goes, Dun Dun, like this. <laughs> And it was like, you know, I guess we're trying to get the kids at a young age. Right. That's exactly how Mike posted it. You have the young kids, it'll be like a little kitty thing. But you could just see that this, probably, sure, the mother is obsessive. And our first question was with the crew is, what's the kid doing up that late? You know, but the thing is, is, you know, you can see that this child is up at night. The mother's watching it all the time. And the child has seen enough of the episodes to, to mm -hmm. do a little dun dun. You know? I, so, I, think it's, I think it's interesting to note that the, when Law and Order first premiered, the internet wasn't even around. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so this whole notion of, of taking a story that's quote unquote ripped from the headlines, it was fairly regionally mm -hmm. oriented. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a very New York kind of sensibility in that it was cited after the New York Post. Mm -hmm. But over the course of years, these past two decades, we've truly become a global society where information is is right there at the touch of a fingertip, and so uh, at, the at the touch of a button. Um, and it still remains compelling. It's you compelling know, because email. there's immediate familiarity with it, and yet what Law and Order has been keen to do, and, and I think it speaks to its success, is that it always, always, always flips it on you. So the opening teaser pulls you in, the first act, it gives you that all the familiar guideposts. Right. You go, oh, I know the story. This is where the woman drove her car into the water with her kids and you think you're and and every episode is a murder mystery so you're following it along and you think you know where it's going but invariably every episode they give you the smackdown and they take you in an entirely different direction <laughs> and that's what it's like crack cocaine that's what keeps you coming back <laughs> well, it's even right if you were at the last panel the theme was how addictive the series is and um they Talked. There's this theme of crack and heroin. And oh really? Yeah. <laughs> but can I? But yeah. I think. But um, 
ripping from the headlines, I mean, has a very, very long history in crime fiction. I mean, crime fiction has always worked with what's happened, you know. Right. Jack mm -hmm. the Ripper murders. I mean, I got an email this. yesterday from a couple of people, and they just apprehended this guy that the, the, with the, um, who's killing people with the two initials, the initial killer, they call him. What? Yeah, they, they, he, um, all his victims have like, you know, their first and last name have the same initials. Uh, well, BB, I'm only... <laughs> Pam, I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> what, all, what, what city was this? I, I think it, they're all women, actually. Oh. <laughs> You're saying? Yeah. Uh, but, you about the New York, but seriously, New York murders? No, the, yeah, New York and oh, California. Is and and I got emails from York? people saying, when is this going to be a law and order? I mean, <laughs> it's kind of like people are now starting to send, they, they identify something, and it wow. just sort of the. So process. art imitating, life imitating. Yeah, go. But so it goes life. back to the internet and all that, yeah. and a lot of people kind of, you have a lot more access to news, a lot more access to different stories. Mm -hmm. And people just tend to, they send, they forward stuff. It's, it's very. Mm -hmm. yeah. Charlotte, so do you want to kind of continue? Because that was, that's an interesting tradition that you're bringing up. Well, I don't, I don't, want, I don't, I don't want to sort of go through the history right. of ripping things from the headlines. But I just want to, that's one of the ways that crime fiction makes you believe it, mm -hmm. makes you think it's true. Because that's a recognition that Benjamin was talking about. He said, oh yes, I think I heard that. But also, I think the other side of the ripping from the headlines is what Arthur was talking about. I think this is very, very important. It's not just the stories that we see in something like Law and Order are familiar and come from the headlines, but it's also the way in which they're shown to us on the show mm -hmm. shape how we understand headlines when we read them again. Mm -hmm. Yes, and they will begin to shape the way in which Headlines are made, and I think that was a story yeah. you were telling in some yes. ways. Yeah, there's a there's an episode last season of the last season of Law and Order, and it had something in it that was really really interesting. We had I think we had kind of done the story before, but I thought that at the end of the the show it captured something, and uh, I forgot the name of it and all that. Look there. I have six episodes in my head between Criminal Tent, SVU, and Law and Order Lola right now. I've got the six episodes, but I can't remember them all. But this one, which is very touching, was it was last season. A lady is with kids in the car. She goes on yeah, the the, ro the <coughs> road. The Taconic. That's Criminal yes. Tent. No, 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 that was no, that was a Law and Order. It was a Taconic. It was, it was Law. <laughs> she goes on the road. Uh, backwards and ends up the yeah. car explosion. And it's, it's about the husband defending his, there's only one child that was alive and the child ended up dead. But it was an interesting take on how this f husband had to defend his wife and um, what she did in life, because she worked for a, uh, a pharmaceutical company. And she was a uh, whistleblower, and her boss ended up giving her a pill that ended up making her fall asleep, which means that she fell, she got disoriented and crashed and killed everybody in the car. And um, this episode specifically captured the emotion of the loss of this family and of the children. But what it did was, after we went through all the law and found out who was guilty and everything, at the end of the episode, and I don't remember us ever really capturing this, was the, the father comes back to the district attorney. They tell him that the guy got, you know, 35 years to life, three different lives and everything. But it captured this moment of this father lost. And at the end of it all, he won the case. They got vengeance over. The, they found out who the bad guy was. But he was still standing there with the loss of his family. And, that, and there was nothing else to say. And they kind of looked at each other. And he says, well, I guess that's it. And they looked at each other and said, yeah. And he says, well, he didn't say anything. And he walks away. And I thought it was one of the most unusual times that we've ever captured that even when you win or whatever, how big the case is, at the end of it all, it's still the loss of the family or the individual that the person that's left living has still has to live with for the rest of his life. Or, but it was, we rarely ever do that. We usually end on the justice of law and this sort of thing. But when you personalize it sometimes, it really captures uh, the pure emotion of what 
all of us have in this room and what you, when you're watching the show. One of the, I mean, one thing I, I remember that episode now and the, um, something that Law and Order does over and over again that illuminates the real ambivalences of law is vigilantes, either bad vigilantes or good vigilantes, and, or in other words, like sort of redeeming vigilantes who have killed some horrible person, but the law must be enforced. And so it really you know, constantly forces people to think, especially in the, la in the second half of the shows, uh, you know, how the law functions, that it's not simply morality. In fact, it's often, contrary to what people might think is morality. Right. And you know the kinds of choices that are made and, and the outcomes that pursue. But I really find mm -hmm. that the vigilante theme is something that sort of captures our better and worse demons in society and then how that bucks up against the right. law enforcement right. model. It, it demonstrates time and again, too, that, that justice is not always served. That, in fact, yeah. oftentimes the bad guy does get away, just like in real life. And, um, I, I think it's that it's it's that uncertainty of what the outcome is going to be um, is that is what in part keeps you coming back for more as an audience view. Yes. Well, and also really the way in which you've got you've got a structure in which you have to think about the relationship between law and justice, yeah. which is a long story. You know, right. I mean, there are many genres of fiction that tell us about, and and you have to negotiate you used negotiation before, you have to negotiate the contradictory ideas about mm -hmm. the rule of law and the sense of what's just. And then within that structure, mm -hmm. you can put in individual topics. Mm -hmm. You can sort of put those in and those can be quite different e each week. And so you get caught up in different ways. What's the great debate over, the, it's, the, it's the great battle between right and wrong, good versus evil. And, and what I always appreciated about um, what the writers put out on the show is that their distinct perspectives that are that are equally smartly represented. Um, Angie Harmon, when she came on the show uh, as the assistant ADA to Sam Waterston's character, she was you know she was pro death penalty, um, and some of us other characters on the show, uh, if we were not necessarily certain about it, we you know we had varying opinions uh, as to position that that staunch. She's from uh, Texas. She's from Texas, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. Um, <laughs> You know, in, in that it's equal representation, I think that it, yeah. it provides a smart arg argument to both sides, really. Mm -hmm. Helping you, le leading you on some level down a road that helps you make your own decision about what your feeling is. And even more so, bringing Fred Thompson on, that character, was much more of, because, you know, New York is largely <coughs> such a blue, <coughs> blue city, and, and the show had been, you know, variations on a democratic, you know, political themes, and then having the Thompson character along with the Angie Harmon character was really bringing in the, a real dramatic tension around what, what justice looks mm -hmm. like, what punishment should be, how uh, to prioritize, you know, different attitudes about the law. I was watching an episode last night that you were in where um, Jack McCoy had to suppress evidence in order to get, um, the conviction that he wanted, it was um, a drunk, a guy who was drunk and wound up killing three people and he had committed a crime before and it, so he suppressed some evidence and in order to get the right verdict. Um, and then he turned around and he didn't, he unsuppressed it and kind of put his own career at risk. Um, but it, I think that's a, just an, one example of the ways in which this series and, and some of the issues that you brought up has such a unique way of representing the concepts of guilt and innocence and crime um, and the criminal justice system. So I'm wondering, you know, for some of you, even Charlotte, if you, you know, how do you see the criminal justice system being represented on TV and seeing this show as any kind of unique representation or any deviation and, or historical? Evolution. Well, I have to say, which you can probably tell from my accent, I have to say that every single thing I know about the US criminal justice system comes from television. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, everything, Perry Mason, Columbo, yeah. right through to... <laughs> so I, I can't really talk about what it's, 
what it does in relation to the US. Well, even in, US in the UK, that's, you know. That, I can't really do that. But in relation to um, the, the UK version, Law and Order UK, which we've, only, which we've had for two years. Mm -hmm. It's very good, too. Uh, two years, and of course, we have much uh, shorter seasons than you. They're, they're 13 episodes, something like that, which seems really long to us. <laughs> okay, because we're used to sort of six or seven. And in, in relation, and of course, the, the British broadcast environment is completely different. I mean, it's not as different now as it was, but there is, um, although you may think that we spend our time in long dresses, um, having cups of tea in stately homes. You mean you don't? <laughs> um, in fact, you know, that, that exportable British television, which I suppose in crime terms would be maybe Poirot or Miss Marple or more, so yes, sort of crime in university towns or Midsummer Murder, something like that. There is a very, very long tradition of quite hard-hitting, socially analytic TV drama in Britain. Crime and Suspect is a good example. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah, exactly. but that's kind of on on even that is on the on the kind of fast moving edge. Mm. Yes, but yes, Prime Suspect in particular that was very shocking yeah. when it when it when it first came came on. So what's really striking in that contents about Law and Order UK is is that it seems to us it still seems very fast. Yes, it's, it hasn't got all that peripheral causal detail mm -hmm. that there is a long tradition of in, in, in British television. So that, that's quite interesting. And I think one of the things about, and that's even this careful location shooting, you know, a lot of walking by the Thames, a lot of landmarks. Yeah. But in a way, I think it does offer to us, even though so much of it is British, it does offer to us what looks to us like an American version of British justice, because mm -hmm. It works. <laughs> <laughs> and Are you trying to say our justice system doesn't work here? No, I'm saying, I'm not saying anything about your job, but I'm saying that the success of the show, the fastness of the show, the speed of the show could make you think that British justice was like that. Mm -hmm. Which, of course, it's the opposite. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, most people don't realize, though, that you know the majority of court cases, I mean, uh, the case on Michael Jackson's uh, doctor, I mean, they're going to court now, and that's a year and, a, a right. year and four months ago that this mm -hmm. happened. So, I mean, a lot of the cases are, are six to eight months before they actually go that we're really making leaps and bounds here, and they're not as fast as actually what they seem on television. I remember watching the O.J. Simpson trial, and I was like, wow, now I get why we cut all that out. <laughs> we get right to the detail, because man, is that boring. Um, but um, it, it, we, we, we are saying that it goes fast, but it is a long, it's, these she shows are all a year. I mean, these cases are all a year, 10 months to a year. And that case can go on for three months. Uh, they're not really fast cases, but, you know, it's like everything you see a card or you see a cut to another scene, that seemed to be a week or two weeks later, actually. It doesn't feel that way. And I think it's a good thing it doesn't feel that way because you want to feel the urgency of trying to solve the case. Yeah, and the but service yes. of drama. Yes, yes. Yeah. It oh, does, absolutely. It yeah, the services, to, you want to be to film. You don't want to go, yeah. well, now for a week later. Yeah, yeah. 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 absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because everybody, you yeah. know, and Ben will tell you is that he, on his desk as a police officer, that he has eight different cases the 15 different cases going on at the same time. So it's that's really good that we just... Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, okay. Mm. Um, I'm wondering, you know, we can even go down the line, but Pam and anybody else, um, do you have an, one particular episode that you felt was most engaging or kind of most controversial with respect to the representation of social issues and... You know, what was at stake and how did the show either push that cultural conversation or get involved in their debate in some way, so much to the same way that Lisa brought up how Memo from the Dark Side did with torture? Um, that's a very, very good question, but I have sort of the same situation Arthur has going on where a lot of the episodes sort of, with multiple shows and everything, a lot mm -hmm. of them kind of blend together. But um, there have been so many. 
I mean, they're, they're, the ones I remember are the ones where, where we got phone calls because somebody was upset. And, and I think if you, again, if you talk to the writers and the producers, um, because they really are the heart and soul of the show, along with the actors and, and, and the people actually putting the show together, um, you know, Law and Order is an equal opportunity offender. So, yeah. you know, yeah. any, you, you name a group, and, and it is a very fair show. I mean, for one show that you think is possibly left wing, left leading, there's another show that goes the other way with, with Angie's character pulling it back because of her, you know, the hook 'em horns. You know, she was very, very Texas. So um, I think that the, the shows, I do like the rip from the headlines ones because they kind of, they tend to track a little better on the publicity side. But there are just so many different episodes. I honestly, that, that's a really good question, but I can't really, you, you, I can't really pull one out specifically. But I just, I think that, again, on the broad strokes, what I think is the most valuable asset of the show is that it does cover all the bases. And it's not just a show where, the defense, you know, is bad. It, you know, the, the Perry Mason and, and the historical defense-based shows, you know, every week it was, you know, mm -hmm. the, the prosecutors were the bad guys. No, there's, that's not the way it works. There are times when maybe the wrong person is being prosecuted and the prosecutors, if they're really good at what they do, still have their job, but then they can also, if there's reasonable doubt, maybe the right, per, the, the right verdict will be will be reached, but it's not just about good and bad or black and white. There's a lot of gray, and I mm -hmm. think that that is really just such an amazing, for, for 20 years, that the show has really captured that as, as its greatest accomplishment. Well, even next Monday we have an episode, you know, because since the, we call it the mothership has left us right now, for now um, which is dealing with um, the the town that stole all the money, El Monte, I think, Bell. or De Bell, yeah. Bell, yes, which is, that's a classic rip from the headline. The show, the episode that's on this coming Monday is, is that story. Mm -hmm. And that's a, you know, that case happened, what, six weeks ago, uh, two months ago? And we're doing that story. And then we're doing the Ronnie Chasen story that's going to be on, I think, the following week after that. Um, so. But it's not a publicist who gets shot. Huh? <laughs> yes, but it's not a. It's still dealing with. We cannot tell you who actually killed Ronnie Chasen, but uh, it, it's dealing. It's it is a rip from a headline story. I think I think two. your theory, your yours meaning Renee's and the writers. If you watch this episode, it's a very interesting episode because there was a lot of question about what happened to her and mm -hmm. and how. Interesting that it just got wrapped up very quickly, and there's been a lot of speculation. So I think that the well, Rene was brilliant. He was he took two stories and wrapped it into that story, and it's just and this is classic of what he does with the writing of combining two stories to make it one. But it um, it's mm -hmm. it's pretty good. But years ago, I was part of an episode called uh, <clears throat> it was the Crown Heights episode, and this was. 15 years ago, it was a um, uh, black kid who was killed by a Jewish driver in Harlem that caused a riot. Mm -hmm. And um, I tell you, we had more calls on that episode of p pros and cons of it. Because there was one line in there where Constantine, I forgot the name Michael of the Constantine. Uh, Michael Constantine is on the stand. and. He, and he admits to is that when you're walking on the streets in New York City and you see two black kids following you. Now remember, this story is 1995 or six. five ish, six ish. So this is after the riots here. Um, and he says, and you see two black kids following you, and you're a white person. If you tell me that you're not scared, you're a liar. And it was so. It was so right on at that moment because of what was going on in the United States after the Rodney King riots here and everything that um, 
you know, it, it, you got a lot of calls on that. You know, people were offended by it. People were like, yes, we agree. You know, we're not going to say it out loud, but yeah, we do agree to that. And that's the controversy that we really, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, that we tackle. And even in that episode, you know, Shabala Green was the one who was playing the, uh, the attorney. Okay. And she says to, uh, well, that was, yeah, that was like 94, I think. And she turns to uh, Michael. And she says to him, she says, you know, you might want to fight for all of this and your beliefs, but, you know, just hanging a picture of Bobby on the wall, just, which is Bobby Kennedy, mm -hmm. just ain't going to cut it anymore. And I'm just saying those kind of lines and that kind of writing is just so right core to a lot of emotion and what people are feeling and just verbally just saying it and acting. It brings out a lot in everybody. You know? as, as we discuss the social impact of the show, um, uh, as it influences our, uh, our societal view of the, of the process of law and the criminal justice system. I, I think, um, and I know it's not on your topic list, there's a, there's a, a subtler uh, influence that's gone on over the years um, that I think has improved society and on a personal level has had a profound impact on my life and that, and that is the way Dick Wolf uh, perceives the world and then puts it into his stories. As a young actor, I, I came up uh, as a young actor of color um, with, with slim few opportunities to portray any character that was complex in any level, um, you know, drug dealers, gangbangers, that kind of thing. But as far as I can remember, and my first, um, my first job uh, with Dick Wolf was a, a short-lived series called Nasty Boys. In every show that he's ever created, he populates the world of that story the way he sees it, which is women, women of color, other people of color, white folks, all interacting with one another. And whether you're talking about Law and Order, or SVU, or Man in the Machine, or Nasty Boys, or Players, or any number of shows that he's created. New York Undercover. The New York Undercover, yeah. He's reflected back to us, even when we weren't really aware of, of, the, of the dearth, the absence of, of people of color on the screen. He's reflected back to us and allowed us to see, see a reflection of ourselves as it exists. In other words, yeah, we, women of color can be in positions of power. Women can be in positions of power. Uh, you know, you could, hey, what a novel idea. And this, this, this began way back in the 80s when the opportunities were few, and so, um, you know, I, I don't, I wouldn't say that Dick had a particular agenda. Okay. It's not like he was, you know, you know, a, you know, a member of the affirmative action mm -hmm. committee. But, <laughs> but um, he's a smart man, and I think he 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 realized a long time ago that that the stories are relatable because we're all really the same at the end of the day, human beings, whether you're brown, black, white, yellow. I mean, so he's given tremendous opportunity to actors from B.D. Wong to Courtney Vance to Jesse L. Martin, mm -hmm. myself, to Pate Murkison. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. At a time when, mm -hmm. when other, other film and television mm -hmm. producers wouldn't consider it because it wasn't commercially viable. So um, I also very much appreciate the social impact that Law & Order has had on us as a society from that perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, but I think that that raises a whole set of things that are important about the social significance of the show, which is that it's not just the issues. The issues are very, very important. Mm -hmm. Yes, the way it deals with the issues. But I think um, its repetitions are perhaps as important. Yes, so both the repetitions that you begin to see that it's peopled with all sorts of different people, right. but also just the repetition, that structure, it's telling you repeatedly, and I think reassuring you, it's saying it might be difficult, but it's, you know, that the American state is here, the legal system does work, and it is, it, and I think that repetition may be as important in its social significance as any particular story it's it tells. reassuring isn't yeah, it? i think it's yeah. reassuring yeah. definitely yeah. I, think I think that so. one of the elements that are, has also been very educational for society is the vast range of depictions of mental illness either sort of you know people who are genetically mental or whatever the issues are or as a result of certain kind of social phenomena and the depictions of mental illness and how that 
gets played out in terms of the questioning and, and the trials and so on, I think has been, and just to sort of really humanize and depict the complexities of, of people's um, actions and decision making when it's mm -hmm. as complicated by circumstances of uh, serious mental illness or tr you know some psychic trauma, and I think that's been highly educational. Uh, I wanted to ask. This is primarily for Ben Bratt. Um, Dick Wolf has always been so articulate that story takes precedence over character. Um, and that character is always in subservience of the story. Um, every now and then you'll, you find out about uh, Jack McCoy's daughter or one of Lenny Briscoe's ex-wives. But <laughs> it, we're, the, the character I think that has the most character development was the character Ray Curtis, um, who is, um, for me, um, he's, He's straight arrow, he uses his, he's, he's religious, he uses his religiousness to break a suspect. He won't cut corners. Lenny Briscoe never met a corner you wouldn't cut. <laughs> um, it's, uh, uh, it's Ray Curtis who has an affair, uh, that has a wife that has MS, who has, uh, I, what I'm wondering is, are the writers create the show, you're the actor. But do you influence, did you influence the fact that your character, the character of Ray Curtis, had more character development, I think, than any other? It's called bribery. <laughs> uh, no, you know, I, I, I believe I enjoyed a unique experience in that when I joined the show, it was already up and running for, I think, five seasons. And because of my, uh, my prior relationship with Dick, I, I got a random phone call in 1993. Um, and at that point, uh, with the help of some friends, had just blew my life savings producing the first independent film that my brother ever wanted to direct and write. And I was flat busted and the phone rang. And truly, like something dropping out of the sky, it was Dick Wolf saying, hey, do you want to go to New York and, and work on Law and & Order? And I said, well, give me a minute. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, and that began a, a, a really uh, a first time process for me, really, where I, I flew to New York and in a hotel conference room, I met with uh, a group of about 10 or 12 people, among them Jerry Orbach, Epatha Murkerson, Dick, uh, the showrunner, Ed Sharon at the time, uh, and a lot of the staff writers. And we started pinging information back and forth. Dick had a very clear idea that he wanted. Uh, a character that was Latin, that was uh, um, uh, morally and religiously righteous, straight arrow, as you say, uh, but also passionate in his temperament. So, because um, he thought it would be obviously a good clash with this more seasoned um, corner cutting <laughs> partner of his, yeah. played in the person of Jerry Orbach. Uh, what I enjoyed was. Uh, 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 the ability to have some input is to uh, define what his, what his background was. I wanted to reflect a person that was like me, a bicultural person. My, my mother's from South America. My father is, is uh, someone I refer to as the whitest man in America. <laughs> yeah, his, his people are from Michigan, of English and German descent. Uh, and so they even allowed me to come up with a name, Ray Curtis. Um, Renaldo was a reflection of the Latin heritage, and Curtis is like my own last name, a reflection of the Euro Eurocentric um, origin. But um, that was really it. Dick came in with a very specific idea of what he wanted. Um, and, then, and then as it played out over the four years I was on the show, um, you know, Dick has, has often been quoted as saying that, that um, the cast is e easily interchangeable because this the stories are really what carry the day, and I, I'm, I'm loath to concede it, but he's absolutely right. And the fact that the show has run for 20 years is really proof mm -hmm. to that fact. Um, I will, however, say uh, pridefully that uh, during my tenure, when it was Jerry Orbach and Carrie Lowell and Sam Waterston and um, Stephen Hill, 
you paint the Murkerson. That was the power band of the show. It's when we won the Emmy in 1997. And, and certainly not because I was there, but because there was a, there was a, there was an alchemy that came about that, that I hadn't, I haven't really seen since. No, hey, no disrespect. <laughs> I also want to add maybe that Emmy. I was there. Oh. <laughs> Arthur's got an um, Emmy. I was there. <laughs> I just want to add for the students in the room that Benjamin is a former gaucho. So maybe that, <laughs> maybe that UCSB degree, in addition to the talent, had something to do with the success. So finish your degree. I wonder um, if you could talk about what I think is one of the most uh, important areas of social significance, and that is the impact of the show on jury service. Um, you know, I know uh, that there is a way in which some attorneys will talk about the law and order effect about, I mean, it, can, it goes both ways. It most makes people willing to serve, which is obviously good, uh, but it also, you know, creates certain expectations. And then I don't know if any of you know about um, what went wrong with law and order trial by jury as, a, as the one failed part of the franchise? Well, I'm just going to address the jury issue first. Um, and I have never, uh, I've heard these stories from, I think anybody who, who talks to somebody who's done jury duty, and I actually have never been called onto a jury, but that's something separate. But um, I think that what they do is, and a lot of you may already have this experience, uh, they'll say this is not an, you know, they'll, they'll actually bring up law and order when they're talking about, you know, this isn't an episode of law and order. It's not going to get resolved in, in 45 <laughs> minutes. And um, so I think that the short answer is that I think that it has had a positive impact because you see the importance and the power of the jury, but it is not wrapped up in 45 minutes, that's for sure. So I think that's the only people have to understand that this is a snapshot of what's really going on in the justice system, but, and it goes back to what we were talking about before, you don't see the, the cops making hours and hours and hours of phone calls going through reams of, of, of paper to try and get that one clue that you, in five, you know, you know, it's in the next scene. You've got, you've got, you know, it does accelerate a lot. So that's, um, I do think it's had an impact, though. I mean, I think that would be more of a question for, for an attorney. But I think that it has had an impact in the sense that people do now understand the process a lot better. Lisa, in your experience as, you know, a sociologist, <laughs> as even, you know, in your travels to Guantanamo, do you see the show as having any kind of impact in people's understanding? I'm sure it does. And we, I mean, in some ways, I like the fact that the show uh, doesn't um, often focus heavily on the jury. I mean, that be that's been an element in a few things. But to some extent, uh, you know, just watching actual juries, it's. You don't want to, it's like you don't want to see how the sausage is made. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's really, you don't want to watch too much of that. Um, but, and I find that some of the, uh, and I would say that about the military juries I've seen at Guantanamo as well, but it, you know, to the extent that the show has had an incredible educational effect, I think that it just gives people an awareness, hopefully, because one of the big frustrations for lawyers is the idea that, um, people, the, the kinds of people who actually get onto juries are the people who know the least, you know, in society. Anybody who's smart enough to get out of jury duty will, and, and it becomes incredibly <laughs> frustrating. I, well, I just haven't been picked. Yeah. I mean, not to say that that's true of everybody, but lawyers don't want people who are incredibly smart, uh, smart and opinionated. They right. want a tabla rasa. And so, to some extent, the, um, the show Law and Order at least provides people with an awareness about how jurisdictional clashes can come up, or the fact that the police, uh, you know, not doing a correct procedure on pretrial detention is going to have some bearing on what they must do as the jury. So, I've always been impressed by, and, and to my recollection, correct me if I'm wrong, Arthur, that there's never been any story specifically focused on the jury, but 
whether yeah. we're talking about uh, the Mothership show or any of the spinoffs, mm -hmm. whenever they're in trial, and it happens in post, when they cut away the jury, mm -hmm. and mind you, these are, these are extras, these are actors, I, I believe, because they're, they're being shot oftentimes simultaneously Why one of the lead actors, Sam, uh, Sam Waterston, for example, is, is giving his, his summary, they're so caught up in the drama that what registers on their face is what mm -hmm. a real jury mm -hmm. would look like. And oftentimes, just the cutaway, depending on the timing mm -hmm. of it, it influences you as a viewer as to what your own opinion might be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's almost a blank slate sometimes, and yet you mm -hmm. kind of project yeah. your own emotional reaction to what you're watching mm -hmm. onto their faces. It's, it's definitely done. Trial by jury addressed that issue of, of the jury more than Law and Order has. Specifically, we mm -hmm. had scenes in Trial by Jury that were with the that were with that that were really dealing with their decision making, um, and uh, I we didn't ha I don't think and Dick again Dick will can elaborate on this a lot more than I can but I don't think we had a chance to really delve in that long enough because there wasn't uh, the show didn't have we were over in a, in one season, um, but. Um, we would have been able to deal with that a lot more in that show because it, it warranted us to go with the jury on several different episodes, which made it interesting of the, you know, you had a little bit of 12 angry men going on there or, you know, 12 angry men and women. But um, yeah, that was one of the nice things about Trial by Jury, that short-lived series. Uh, I don't, you know, it all boils down to, you know, you don't get good numbers, you're not gonna stay in the air for competition. Mm -hmm. basically what it's really about. I uh, had a question about the pros and cons of doing a series versus a serial uh, in tackling social issues. And I was thinking, uh, as an example, that uh, The Wire can go deep into maybe one issue, whereas um, Law & Order does a good job of doing many issues in a timely manner. Are there particular uh, limitations or opportunities that you find in the creative process that a, a series provides as opposed to a serial? Well, uh, they're, they're both actually TV series. Uh, what you're referring to is the format. Uh, Law and Order is, is what's known as a closed, a, a closed end show, closed format show, where every episode has, has its own individual beginning, middle, and an end. And there might be strands that follow over the course of a se season or even several seasons. Um, but The Wire was a serialized program, which means you had to follow each episode to know what was going on over the course of the season. Um, yes. what, what's, what's, what's been proven the most commercially viable, and, and I say that only because it's important, because it allows you to stay on the air, are these closed-end formats. And that's why you see yeah. you know, this wellspring of you know, CSI Miami and CSI Nantucket and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Charlotte, did you want to speak to that? Well, well, there was um, a British ser series in 1978 called Law and Order, which is just four 90-minute shows. And that, you could, you could clearly see the question of commercial viability, actually, in that. And what they did there was they had the separation, they had each story was from the point of view of a different person involved in the criminal justice system. It started with a detective, but then it went into the story of what in that, that version was called the villain, the criminal. Mm -hmm. So they had a whole session. Oh, so it went on the other side. Uh, yeah, and then it had the lawyer. Mm -hmm. And then it finally, the last one was called The Prisoner's Tale. And by that stage, when you got to, in the anticipation to The Prisoner's Tale, Everybody concerned, each of the principals, had broken the law so much <laughs> that you didn't know quite mm -hmm. who the... Pre I mean, you did because it was a setup. Now, that, was, that had to be closed format because it was making radical arguments about the corruption of the British criminal justice system. So it couldn't run and run. But it, so <laughs> therefore, it was a serialized program. It was only four episodes. Yes, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. a format that, that typically we don't enjoy yes. in the United That's, States. Well, it was obviously the particular, the broadcast environment mm -hmm. that would allow them to make mm -hmm. something that was so controversial. Um, like this quite. What? I'd like to see it. Yeah. 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 Charlotte also wrote a book on it. 
Available on Amazon.com. Uh -huh. uh -huh. That's it, right there. She wrote a book. Well, I think the title goes us something. Uh, there it is. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. Please help me thank the panelists. <laughs>